Thank you very much to everyone here at Chawton House for inviting me to be part of the Literary Lockdown Festival. It's terrific to be back in scare quotes at Chawton where I started my career nearly two decades ago now, she says, with some nervousness. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to chat to some of you in the live Q&A afterwards. I'm here today to talk about a book that Alison Larkin and I published in March of this year with Pavilion entitled Jane Austen Embroidery. Jane Austen Embroidery is a crossover book. It's a, it's a crossover history and craft book that combines essays by me on needlework in Jane Austen's time and novels, not just her novels, I have to say other people's novels too, um, along with 15 modern embroidery projects using Georgian patterns and designed to suit all levels of ability from the absolute beginner to the embroidery expert. The book combines my love of women's history, of women's writing, fashion history and sewing because yes I do also sew myself although I'm very much the amateur compared to Alison. Putting the book together and ushering it into print with the wonderfully talented editorial and creative teams at Pavilion um, has been quite honestly the most fun work project I have ever done, probably ever will do, um, and it's really lovely actually to have the opportunity to share with you some aspects of the delightful and I have to say completely um, unexpected journey that led to its publication. Now we all I think have our favourite Jane Austen anecdote. Yours might be an acerbic line perhaps from the correspondence, it might be a witty scene from one of the novels, I certainly have my fair share of those, but actually my favourite Jane Austen anecdote is comes from neither of those sources, it's actually an anecdote captured by one of her nieces Marianne Knight who recalled once sitting silently with her aunt by the fireside at Godmersham Park only for the piece to be disrupted by her aunt, the novelist, bursting into laughter, putting down her needlework, running to a table, frantically scribbling something, we don't know what, although it's implied it might be one of, one of her novels, before returning and quietly working as before by the fireside. Now I really, really love this anecdote. Um, and I love it partly, I think, because it so roundly counters that once very popular view of Jane Austen um, as a demure woman writer, so troubled by the possibility that others might find out about her scribbling, that she kept that door creaking on its hinges down in, in the cottage in Chawton. But I also love it because this anecdote suggests quite clearly, I think, um, that Jane Austen saw needlework and the intellectual labour of novel writing or the, the labours of the novelist as she refers to it in Northanger Abbey as continuous practices. Now in thinking along those lines Jane Austen was certainly not of a mind with all women of her day of course. Mary Wollstonecraft represented many of her generation when she railed in her 1792 Vindication of the Rights of Woman against embroidery as a mode of repression that she felt was essentially designed to keep women's hands busy while their minds languished. Mary Lamb, a couple of decades later, put it only slightly differently and certainly more succinctly when she wrote Needlework and Intellectual Improvement are naturally in a state of warfare. Um, and in case you're unfamiliar with uh, Mary Lamb's story, very talented, very, very clever woman, sister of the essayist Charles Lamb, was forced to undertake paid needlework to support her family and very tragically, accidentally killed her mother while attempting to attack her dressmaker's apprentice during one of several bouts of very severe mental illness that blighted her life. 
Now, the views of the likes of Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Lamb have for a very long time shaped, determined, over-determined, I would say, how we've thought about needlework and women's attitudes to needlework in the 18th and 19th centuries. And one of the things I think that that Marianne Knight anecdote that I just mentioned reveals clearly is that their perspectives, whilst representative of some other women, of course, were not entirely universal. Jane Austen, along with many other Georgian women, um, Mary Washington in America or Mary Delaney, for instance, both of whom I talk about in the book Jane Austen Embroidery, women like these saw intellectual labour and needlework as not only compatible activities, but potentially also mutually enriching ones. They were not just things you could things that you could both do, but they somehow informed each other in interesting ways. Now there's plenty of evidence in Jane Austen's biography and in the small material archive that she has left to us to indicate that the novelist was a very talented stitcher and that she took pride in this work just as she took great pride, of course, in her novel writing. She declared herself the neatest worker in the party of women who made shirts for her brothers and by all accounts she was even more skilled at ornamental needlework. Her nephew James Edward Austin Lee famously wrote that his aunt would have put a sewing machine to shame and we can perhaps see why. The quilt that she co-created and which will be familiar to many of you who visited, who visited Jane Austen's House Museum of course and a needle case that she made for Mary Lloyd demonstrate that she had considerable technical competency, although we can't use either of those artefacts to test Austin Lee's claims about his aunt's excellent satin stitch, because she doesn't use satin stitch in either of those objects, of course. Um, but if this gorgeous white work Indian muslin shawl, also held by Jane Austen's House Museum, is the author's handiwork, as many of her family believe, then her nephew was not exaggerating. This is really delicate, beautiful work. And Jane Austen's correspondence is absolutely full of references to needlework, from plain sewing those shirts that I mentioned earlier, trimming bonnets, embroidering shoes, and indeed making caps. And that leads me on to my second favourite Jane Austen anecdote, uh, which comes in the form of a letter uh, that Jane writes to Cassandra, in which she describes being flattered to learn that their friends, um, Martha Lloyd and Mrs Lefroy, had asked them for a, pat cap, a, a cap pattern, sorry, that they'd recently worked. Um, before Jane Austen does a bit of an about turn and declares herself not at all well pleased with Cassandra after all, because Cassandra actually gave the women the pattern and presumably therefore uh, they could have emulated their work and also their sense of style, which I think is a, it's, it's an, it's a rather amusing anecdote and clearly a joke between the sisters. But it poses a question that sort of nagged at me for some time really, which is um, where did she get that pattern from? And indeed other patterns that she worked throughout her life and of course the honest answer is you know we just don't know for sure but a possible source perhaps even a likely source is this the ladies magazine or entertaining companion for the fair sex to give it its full title which was a hugely popular monthly periodical uh, aimed primarily at women although men read it also and it's arguably the first um recognisably modern women's magazine. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, the Ladies Magazine is a wonderfully eclectic publication. Um, I really find it very hard to think of a single event that happens on either the domestic or global stages between 1770, when it begins publication, so that's the year when Lord North's ministry is founded, and when it ceases in 1832, so that's the, the year the Reform Act is passed, I can barely think of a single thing that happens in that 62-year window of time that isn't registered, discussed, debated and reflected on in the magazine. And its range of genres is almost as expansive as the range of events um, that the magazine covers. So the periodical is full of... Um, essays on moral and philosophical subjects and themes, as well as educational topics like um, 
history, geography and, and science. This is from The Moral Zoologist uh, by the wonderful Anne Murray. Travel writing features very prominently in the magazine. This image is taken from its uh, many years long se uh, serialised abridgment of Cook's voyages. Biographies are also very prominent uh, within the magazine as is poetry. There's a dedicated poetry section uh, at the back of the magazine each month. Uh, reviews, news, here you can see the foreign and, and domestic news that gets published within it again every month in its own dedicated section. Fashion reports and also prominent among its content list were, fi was fiction in the form of translations, short stories and serialised novels. And it's the fiction in the magazine primarily that gives us the missing link in the Jane Austen chain and proves that she read it and was familiar with the magazine and that she was familiar with it long before this particular piece, an account of the trial of Jane Austen's aunt, Mrs. Lee Perrott, uh, appeared in the April 1800 issue. Uh, Mrs. Lee Perrott uh, was tried at the Taunton Assizes for stealing a card of lace from the haberdasher Elizabeth Gregory, of which she was speedily acquitted, much to the relief of Mrs. Lee Perrott and all the outraged readers of the ladies' magazine. Now, there's, there's some evidence um, that Jane Austen was reading the ladies' magazine from the 1780s, but she was most certainly accessing it or had some access at a later point to uh, issues from the 1790s. 1794, for instance, saw the publication of a short fiction, The Shipwreck, and it's odds on, really, that Jane Austen read this. Why do I say that? Well, The Shipwreck is a short moral tale, typical in many ways of, of, of the hundreds such tales that were printed in the magazine. It's a short tale about a Miss Brandon, Brandon, a woman possessed of good sense and sensibility. I wonder where we've come across that phrase before, but who is persuaded by her father out of an attachment to a Mr Willoughby. Hmm. In fact, actually, this Mr Willoughby is nothing like the Willoughby in Jane Austen's novel. He's, uh, his first name is Frederick and he's much more of a kind of Wentworth figure, but bear with me. But, you know, the point still stands, I think. But if it isn't enough to convince you of Jane Austen's readership of the ladies' magazine, then I'll point you to just one further example. There are others, but I'll point you to just one more, which is the 1802 short tale, Guilt Pursued by Conscience, which features a Mr Knightley, a country gentleman, who marries an obscure orphan from a rural boarding school, who at the start of the tale is terrified because she is accosted by a man she assumes is a vagrant while walking out in the woods. Now, I don't have time here uh, to reflect on what I think Jane Austen thought about fiction in the ladies' magazine, but I've thought about it a lot and um, I find it extremely interesting. But suffice it to say that um, whatever she thought about it, uh, the fiction in the ladies' magazine was, was one of the things that kept readers coming back to it month after month. It was very popular, not just with its um, immediate generation of readers, but with subsequent generations of readers. So Charlotte Bronte, for instance, was quite a fan and reflects on some of its fiction uh, long after its publication in a letter that she writes. Um, so this was one of the major attractions of the publication, but one other attraction which I haven't yet reflected on and which may also have engaged the attention of a certain Jane Austen was its multimedia content. So each issue of the ladies magazine had between one and three illustrations. This one I'm showing you now is, is one from the shipwreck, that story I mentioned with the Willoughby and the Brandon. Um, so it had illustrations in it. These were very popular. They were regularly scrapbooked uh, by readers. It also published a monthly song sheet. It published fashion plates, although these were only regular features from sort of the middle of the 1790s onwards and particularly after 1800. And it also featured embroidery patterns every month between 1770 and 1819, after which the pattern stopped. Now I first became interested in the ladies magazine about 20 odd years ago when I was working on my PhD um, which was on dress and needlework in 18th century literature and I spent a very happy few months reading what I thought was every essay on dress in the magazine and poring over those fashion plates. 
But the patterns, which I was also very interested in for obvious reasons, were a source of endless frustration to me because virtually none were present in the copies of the magazine that I was reading. And I was going up and down the country, reading them in uh, public libraries and research libraries all over the country. I knew what patterns had once been in the magazine because each pattern title is listed in the magazine's monthly contents pages. So I knew that there were around 650 of them. I even knew what they were for, for men's, women's, children's clothing, accessories and household objects. Um, but, but, I, but I saw virtually none of them. Probably about five, I would think, uh, in, in many, many months of looking. To understand why so few of the patterns have survived, it's probably helpful to say a little bit about how the magazine was um, engaged with and, and kept and put together. So in fact, monthly issues of the ladies' magazine look very different from uh, the bound volumes that most of us read uh, the magazine as today. Monthly issues of the magazine were stitched. Yes, books like frocks were stitched uh, in the 18th century. They, they were stitched 56 page pamphlets they look like really published in these sort of soft uh, bluey brown covers that you can see here and the covers had um, ads on them usually ads uh, for other well primarily uh, ads for other published works but also for things like here we have the bloom of circassia so makeup and cosmetics that kind of thing they're very it's very very rare to find monthly unbound issues of the magazine like this. This one happens to come from special collections at the University of Kent where I work. Um, for, for many years it was the only uh, monthly issue of the magazine that was intact that I'd seen. I, I, I now own a couple myself as well so I've got a, a better handle on, on the, how, how, the mag, how the magazines were bound together. But essentially what happened was that at the end of the year you take your year's worth of issues of the magazine to a book binder and you would have them bound up in the hard covers um, that, as I say, are the other format that we see these copies of the magazine in, in most libraries today. And at the end of the year, in the last issue of each year, the magazine published directions to the binder, which instructed binders on where to put that multimedia content I was just talking about in relation to the text that it illustrated. So here you can see a list of illustrations primarily to uh, illustrations for the short fiction and in the magazine. And sometimes it's travel writing and biographies. Now, one of the things that you notice very quickly if you start scouring these directions to the binder is they don't mention the embroidery patterns that are in the contents pages. Why are the embroidery patterns not mentioned? Well, it's really very simple. They were never meant to be bound in. The patterns were made to be used and to be used in ways that would often not survive the usage. They were never meant to be kept. And because of that, they rarely have survived. Where they have, they are accidents of history. They were never meant to be. Okay, now we know the patterns were used um, and we know this really from a few source types. So we do have some letters um, and we have some diary entries where people refer to using patterns from the magazine. One notable example is the Lancashire governess Ellen Wheaton who writes um, to a friend asking her if she could send patterns from the magazine that she kept um, in a work bag in a, in a chest of drawers at home. That's one kind of example. But there are other ways of proving that the patterns were used quite extensively and that's in the material archive, in museum collections. So for instance this absolutely glorious pair of embroidered shoes which is held in the collections of the Victoria and Albert Museum originates, we've discovered, um, in a pattern from the ladies magazine and this, um, this discovery comes courtesy of the wonderful sleuthing of my uh, North American colleague Dr Alicia Kerfoot who during the stitch off project that I'm going to talk about in just a moment um, recognised a pattern that I'd released and made public on a website as being the origin of these shoes. So you can see there um, the design for the embroidered shoe upper and Alicia saw this and, and thought I've seen this before and realised it was in this pair of shoes that the v catalogue had dated to between 1770 and 1779 and we were able to go back and say actually we can be 
even more precise than that, this is a pattern from 1775. And since Alicia's wonderful discovery, I've come across other examples where we can see patterns for work bags, for instance, and, and other garments and artefacts that originate in ladies' magazine patterns, which is wonderfully um, exciting. Okay, so the patterns were used. Um, they, that's ha that that was the that was the that was the intention. They were never meant to be bound in, um, and so where they have survived, as I say, it's just it, they're just they're just accidents of history, accidents of posterity. They were never meant to be, and it was a very fortuitous accident that five years ago led me to purchase a half year of the magazine for seventeen ninety six. Uh, from a follower of a research project that I was running at the time that had six beautiful patterns in it. I spent years and years looking for these patterns and then one day somebody phoned me up completely unexpectedly and said I've got a copy of the magazine would you like to buy it? I had no idea what was in it, I bought it, it had got six of these wonderful patterns including the one that I'm showing you right now. I felt like all my Christmases had come at once let me tell you. Um, and then within 24 hours this wonderful fortuitous accident was followed by a much less fortuitous one because I was in a car accident driving home from work I was driven into and I sustained a back injury that meant um, I wasn't terribly hurt but it meant I couldn't sit at my desk really for very long and working was quite challenging uh, and I was extremely bored and fed up um, I wanted to do something around my work but not really able to work properly so I thought I know what I'm going to do I'm going to take pictures of this lovely magazine I've got I'm going to put them on Twitter and I was totally unprepared <laughs> for the response uh, that I got. Um, the patterns in particular generated extraordinary excitement. Excitement that started off with a series of questions about, you know, what were these patterns? Where were they from? And how would they have been used? And very quickly turned into a tsunami of questions from people saying, well, how, could I, how could I make that pattern for myself? Tantalised by the prospect of bringing the patterns back to life, um, I launched what I at the time called the great, uh, at the time called the great ladies' magazine stitch off. You can tell the kind of viewing that goes on in the bachelor household, can't you? Um, and I put six the six patterns that I'd acquired on a website. Over the next few weeks, I was able to supplement that original six with a couple of others from eighteen nineteen that I acquired from a, a bookseller in Switzerland and another three patterns that the BBC Radio 3 presenter Penny Gore uh, let me have. She had uh, contacted me because she owned a copy of the magazine herself from 1775, containing that shoe pattern I showed you earlier, which, which had three patterns in it. One of them was this beautiful um, muff pattern that I'm showing you right now, and she very kindly let me release those for people to make too. Within a few months, dozens of professional and amateur embroiderers, as well as textile artists from the UK, from Europe, the US and Australia, were working on modern recreations of the ladies' magazine patterns and sharing their experiences on blogs and Twitter and Facebook. And as some of you will know, in 2016, Gillian Dow invited us to populate a room of the terrific Emma at 200 exhibition here at Chawton House with some of the beautiful objects that people had created. Now I sadly I don't have time here today to talk you through even a fraction of the wonderful pieces that people made for the stitch off but if you came to the exhibition you'll know that people of all ages I think the youngest was eight the eldest was I think 85 um, and from very different um, needlework backgrounds from complete beginners to Royal School of Needlework graduates took part and they interpreted the patterns in very, very different ways. So some pieces were worked using historically authentic methods. Um, so for example, these, um, this wonderful pair of um, shoes with handcrafted and beaten metal buckles, which was created by Nicole Rudolph in a workshop in Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, two machine embroidered modern reinterpretations of the patterns. These ones are by Caroline Hack and Corin Young, both textile artists. And we also had some wonderful um, mixed media reimagining. So this was a delightful reticule um, uh, using a, a, a waistcoat, what was originally a waistcoat pattern that Rachel Whitechurch 
um, a crochet designer turned into this really rather beautiful crocheted reticule. Packing up the stitch off objects to return to their makers at the end of the exhibition was a very sad day for me, I must say. Um, but I consoled myself that, you know, six months after the exhibition had started, 12 months after the stitch off had started, people were still making the patterns. They still are, in fact, I get emails about it all the time. Um, and I consoled myself also with the fact that people were really sort of engaged in the story of the stitch off. And I was um, invited to give a few talks about it, which I really enjoyed doing. And one of those invitations for a talk, uh, an invitation to speak at an Embroiderers Guild event, came from the very first person to have signed up for the stitch off, who was one Alison Larkin. Um, Alison had embroidered my 1796 shawl pattern in situ at the Captain Cook Memorial Museum in Whitby for a Sailor's Wives exhibition that they were holding at the time. So Alison invited me to give this talk and ha showed me some of her absolutely stunning work, some of which uh, was based on ladies' magazine patterns other on other uh, uh, Georgian designs that she had encountered through her research. Uh, I gave the talk and in questions afterwards, I was particularly struck by the comments from one very experienced embroiderer in the audience who pointed to a slide that I had up of one of the patterns and said to me, I couldn't make that. Why? I wondered. Well, because this pattern, like every pattern that the magazine published, all 650 odd of them over that 50 years, Every single one of these patterns was printed like this with nothing else. There's no written instruction at all. So unlike later Victorian magazines and periodicals, which did have information on stitches, on colours, on techniques, on scaling up and scaling down and so forth, there is nothing but the pattern in the ladies' magazine. The, it, the, the periodical could simply trust that the, the girls and the women who were subscribers to it would know what to do with these patterns. In the words of this lovely audience member at the talk I was giving, she said looking at a pattern from the ladies magazine was like looking at a photograph of a finished recipe in a cookbook, but without having the ingredients list and the method, it was daunting and unimaginable. And that observation just kept sort of whirring and whirring around in my, around in my head as, as I started to wonder how many other people might be interested in working with the patterns or learning to make the patterns but were daunted by the lack of written instruction with them and I started to think well how how, how can we get around that because even though I am not a, a great stitcher I'm not in a, even a very good one um, the research that I've done on 18th century women's writing history and material culture meant that I, I knew at least in theory what to do with the patterns and I, I wasn't at all troubled by just having to have a go without any instruction but as I say you know for all my enthusiasm um, I couldn't execute I couldn't claim to be able to execute the designs well enough to create objects from them that others might want to copy I didn't have the kind of vocabulary really to to, to write instructions or to think methodically about how to convey a kind of step by step in terms of making these things. But Alison, who'd invited me to give the talk, who's a professional embroiderer, who teaches embroidery, who has research expertise in 18th century embroidery as a practitioner, could. So Alison and I sat down at the end of the day, very excitedly over coffee, talked about this and said, wouldn't it be great if we could do a book? I have to say, I left Yorkshire that day thinking that yes, it would be very lovely, but we could never make it happen. And now I'm very delighted to say that two years later, Jane Austen embroidery is a reality. So what's the book like? Well, the book um, opens with an introduction by me on needlework in Jane Austen's Britain, introducing the ladies magazine and, and the patterns. Um, and the introduction, like all of the chapters that I've written for it, is, is, is illustrated with some gorgeous photography by Penny Windsor and original artwork by Polly Firm, which you can see here. On the left of the slide. The introduction is followed by a wonderfully um, detailed and clear method section which is written by Alison that gives lots of practical information, that explains key terms and that has um, some very very clear um, stitch diagrams if you're a bit rusty or just simply don't know how to do one of the limited range of stitches that we use in the book. 
The rest of Jane Austen embroidery is divided into three sections, organised around the three principal pattern types that appeared in the magazine. So that is, uh, that is patterns for embroidering clothing, men's, women's and children's, embroidered accessories um, and household objects. And each of these section intros is, is um, full of references to surviving historical objects, portraiture, the life and letters of Jane Austen and other Georgian women like Mary Delaney and Mary Washington, who I meant, I'm sorry, Martha Washington, who I mentioned earlier, to novels by Jane Austen and um, other writers. So novels like Tom Jones, for instance, gets gets quite a, a long discussion in, in, in the, the section I've written about embroidered muffs um, and to the popular it narratives from the middle of the 18th century things like Adventures of a Waistcoat which is a fantastic novel told from the point of view of an ostentatiously embroidered and bawdy waistcoat who has delusions of grandeur and eventually gets his comeuppance. But what of the projects? Well Working with Alison to devise the projects was enormous fun. We had quite the embarrassment of riches in selecting the designs because after my initial purchase of that 1796 volume that had six patterns in it, as I say, I, I, I managed to acquire a few more. Alison did too. And then I've acquired more since. So at the time we started writing the book, we had about 40 patterns, I think, to choose from. I've since probably got another three dozen, I think. And what we tried to do in the book was to select the patterns in such a way that we met three objectives really. First of all we wanted to make sure that whatever patterns and projects we devised for the book were a, a good representation of the different pattern types in the magazine that I've already summarised for you, so for clothes, accessories and objects. Second, we wanted to have a variety of designs that would um, work for people with all levels of familiarity and skill. So if you are an experienced embroiderer there is some there are some projects that will um, you can really get your teeth into, I think. But we also have written this very much with 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 the, the beginner in mind too. So the book starts actually with a very very um, simple but delightful sprig starter pattern. So for a single sprig motif, uh, one flower that you would um, originally have repeated multiple times to create the desired effect on an apron or a gown or a petticoat or whatever you were embroidering but we've just worked it in, in as one um, one design so it's something you can really um, have confidence in beginning and not get daunted by if, if you if you are an, a novice embroiderer so we wanted to we wanted to offer something for everyone and third we wanted to um, include a, a range of patterns and projects that we could tell interesting stories about. Um, either stories that related to what the patterns were originally for, like embroidering shoes. Everyone seems to be fascinated that shoes were embroidered. So it's fun to talk about that. Um, or, to, or that we could tell interesting stories about what we were reimagining the patterns as for the book. Because I should say that this isn't um, strictly or solely a book about faithful historical reproduction. So the methods that Alison uses and describes are historically sensitive, but we've modernised the patterns, given them a bit of a, a twist by turning them into modern, usable, as well as beautiful objects. So the muff pattern that Penny Gore allowed us to use, uh, which I showed you earlier, has been disaggregated. It's a really, really complex design in the original, but we've kind of separated out all of the different elements and Alison has uh, devised a, a napkin set, each with one motif from that very complex diamond uh, lattice pattern on the original. A waistcoat pattern from 1775 has been turned into a gloriously elegant clutch purse. There's a, a wonderful uh, circular crown cap pattern, perhaps not unlike the one that Jane Austen herself might have made, that we've turned into a cushion. Um, and that shawl that Alison originally worked for the Captain Cook um, Memorial Museum has been turned into an iPad case uh, into uh, as a kind of nod to show just how much women's lives have changed from the 18th century to the present. Because of course our world is a very different one from Jane Austen's. Instead of writing by hand and stitching at our frames, most of us spend our days, you know, pounding on keyboards, swiping touch screens and texting or tweeting on our phones, even if we are tweeting about 18th century embroidery patterns in my case. Needlework now tends to be a retreat 
from everyday life. It's also usually, of course, a matter of choice rather than a social requirement. For many of us, needlework is not work, as it was simply referred to in the 18th century, but it's a way of filling our precious leisure time. It's not something we do because we don't know what to do or we haven't anything to do, but because we find in it a creative and intellectually stimulating, um, we, we find it a creative and intellectually stimulating activity that lets our minds open up and wander as our fingers track slowly and carefully over the work that we're doing. And that Marianne Knight anecdote that I began with suggests that Jane Austen may have felt similarly about needlework. Our hope, Alison's hope, my hope, Pavilion's hope I guess too, is that Jane Austen embroidery captures in its essays, in its illustrations and in these wonderful projects that Alison has worked up so gloriously in the book, that the book captures the pleasures of stitching, the pleasures of reading and writing that Jane Austen, like so many of us, then and today, find mutually sustaining. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed the talk um, and I do hope that you enjoy Jane Austen embroidery. Goodbye. <laughs>